of thing. So, yeah. So, Father, we just thank you for Peter. We thank you for uh, his patience in waiting on you uh, for your word uh, to deliver to us this morning. Uh, Father, we just pray that you will be with him. Uh, he may know your presence as he boldly proclaims your word. Father, we just thank you for him. And Father, we just pray that, uh, yeah, that our ears will be opened, our hearts may be receptive. And Father, that uh, you would just lift us all up as Peter speaks to us in your name and for your glory. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Okay, right. Well, can we have the first slide, please? <laughs> so, there we go. Well, this morning's um, message, the inspiration for this actually came from my YouTube feed, would you believe it or not? Um, I, you know, as you uh, surf the net, of course, uh, everybody tracks you. Uh, some of you probably have very sophisticated anti-tracking software or decline all the cookies and everything. To be honest, I don't bother too much. So, uh, you know, if I've, uh, I was looking at cycle computers this morning, now everything I look at has cycle computers in the banners and everything. Anyway, in my YouTube feed, um, I like, uh, I, I do a lot of cycling now, thanks to Ashley, who's sold me one of his old bikes, which is great. Um, so there's all the Global Cycling Network videos that come up. And also amongst my YouTube feed, I get organ music. I like organ music. I like J.S. Bach. Um, I like classical music. And this one occasion in my YouTube feed, there was... Um, a fantasy on Ein Festoborg uh, by a young German organist called Paul Fey, F-E-Y. And I thought, oh, I like Ein Festoborg. I know uh, sometimes, you know, as, as you get older, you think, well, I love the old hymns. I love to sing the old hymns. Well, Ein Festoborg is a, is a hymn written by uh, a German, um, obviously, and uh, it's an old hymn. It's not just an old hymn, it's 500 years old. It's a 500-year-old hymn, so it's a very old hymn. Anyway, it is a fantastic, monumental, triumphant hymn. You know, it extols the, the uh, victory that we have through our God, and that our God is ein fester Burg. Ein fester Burg ist unser Gott. Our God is a mighty fortress. It makes the blood rise, doesn't it? A little bit. Our God is a mighty fortress. Hmm. Anyway, I thought, well, I'll listen to this. And so anyway, this, this young organist, Paul Fay, he plays this fantasy on Ein Festerborg, eight and a half minutes of absolute bliss. You know how it is when an organ, a pipe organ, fills the space, doesn't it? I love listening to um, the festival of... Uh, of uh, readings and carols at, uh, on Christmas Eve. In uh, King's College, you've got the organ and you've got all the congregation there. But there's nothing quite like a pipe organ, is there, to fill a room with sound. And so anyway, I plug, turn the TV on, ultra high definition. I've got speakers this big, you know, this high, 100 watts per channel, and you play this through. So you get the full reverb, you get the full experience. And it's absolutely magnificent, powerful, majestic, wonderful. And on, of course, the last moment, he pulls out all the stops, and the noise is just f fantastic. It fills the place. So it was bliss, but not just because it was a fantastic piece of music. Now, I do like all things German. I mean, sausage, beer, sauerkraut, what's not to like, you know? Famous composers, J.S. Bach. Uh, Ludwig van Beethoven, motorways with no speed limits, great, fantastic. And they're very disciplined about it as well. But um, this organ that he was playing was not any old organ. This guy lives in Leipzig. And he was playing in St. Thomas Kirche, which is the church where J.S. Bach was Kapellmeister. So he was playing Bach's organ. He was playing Bach's organ in Leipzig, and it was, he was playing Ein Festival. It, you couldn't get better than that. Honestly, it doesn't really get any better than that. But what makes this so special for me is that um, 
The song itself, Ein Feste Burg, the hymn itself, is um, written by, by Martin Luther, who was one of the architects of the Reformation. He is pivotal, a key character in the history of the church and was instrumental in really turning over um, the uh, apostasy and the heresy, um, sorry, the, the heresy that was going on in the established church of the day. And the hymn itself is kind of autobiographical of Martin Luther. If you wanted a seminal piece that summed up one person's life and their struggle, if you like, then this would be the, the hymn that, uh, that, that really is the seminal hymn describing Martin Luther's struggle with, um, with the enemy, with the forces of darkness, and with doubt and with fear, and his own feelings of inadequacy. And I think it teaches us a powerful lesson, really, because this hymn itself is all about that battle that we have with the enemy. And we are prone to forget that as Christians, we are in a battle. We are in a battle. So without further ado, I think um, I will show you the hymn itself. Now, for anybody who's going to criticize and saying, well, you're preaching from a hymn, you're not preaching scripture, well, Ashley kindly picked all of those verses. And they're all about the victory that we have through Jesus Christ. And really, that's the theme of this morning's message. I am speaking, uh, I am backing this up with scripture, but I think there are certain hymns which have such strong truths in them that it doesn't really hurt to go through these, these uh, hymns and actually see what, um, uh, what the writer is trying to tell us. So it starts off, A mighty fortress is our God, ein fester Burg. Now this translation is uh, an 1852 translation uh, so it's in 19th century English. I don't know, has anybody ever sung A Safe Stronghold, Our God Is Still? Anybody? Yes, one or two. But a long time ago, probably. I asked my dad, my dad's 94. I asked him yesterday, have you ever sung A Safe Stronghold, Our God Is Still? He said he remembered singing it as a schoolboy. We don't sing this hymn anymore. I think, well, why don't we sing this hymn anymore? Anyway, Thomas Carlyle translated it, A Safe Stronghold Our God Is Still. And that's the version in English that we typically sing. Um, I don't like safe as the translation. It's not right. Uh, ein, that would be ein sicher uh, uh, <coughs> Burg, not ein fester Burg. Fest means, uh, from which we get the English word fast, steadfast, stuck fast, hold fast. That's the impression you get from fest. I infest a bog. A bog is a stronghold. You think of a, a fortified uh, city or a fortified uh, castle or town. A mighty fortress is our God. I think that picture in itself uh, is inspiring, isn't it? That our God is a mighty fortress. He is strong, impregnable. Totally defensible. He is mighty. I love that as, as the opening line. Ein fester Burg ist unser Gott. A bulwark never failing. I'll, I'll help you with some of the 19th century English. I guess some of that might not be terribly, uh, <clears throat> terribly useful in this modern age. But anyway. Our helper he amid the flood of mortal ills prevailing. Mortal ills. Plenty of mortal ills around today, aren't there? There's um, apostasy. People are not interested in God anymore. The love of most is growing cold, as the Bible says it will in the last days. We have wars all over the world. We have problems in, uh, <clears throat> in uh, Arabia, in, the, in Yemen, and uh, in the Persian Gulf there. Um, we have uh, war in Ukraine. Uh, we have dubious politicians trying to run for office again. Uh, I won't go into the politics, but we have plenty on our plate, don't we? Mortal else. And we have our own problems. We have our own sicknesses. We have our own difficulties, financial issues, whatever they happen to be. Whatever problems we may have, he is our helper. Our God is our helper amid the flood. 
And then Martin Luther spends a lot of the rest of this hymn talking about our enemy. And we don't do that terribly often, do we? We don't talk about Satan. We don't talk about our enemy and the demons that are his cohort in church. But I think we perhaps ought to now and then remind ourselves that we do have an enemy. It says, for still our ancient foe does seek to work us woe. His intent is not good. Satan's intent is to destroy us. He is actively seeking to destroy us. And the more we stick our head above the parapet to try and follow Christ and to do what he asks of us, the harder Satan and his cohorts will fight against us and try to knock us down, however that might happen. But usually it's a a still small voice accusing us that we're not good enough and that we're sinful. And those are the things that he accuses us of. He says, uh, Martin Luther says, his craft and power great. The devil is powerful. He's a fallen angel. He was one of the, uh, he was at the level of an archangel. And he fell because he rebelled against God. So he is a powerful being. And he has many followers. His craft, his strategies, and his power are great. And he is armed with cruel hate. On earth is not his equal. One of the things we need to get into our heads, I think, is that the devil is irredeemably evil. Irredeemably evil. There is no good in him. We live in a society which, is, which uh, embraces tolerance, inclusion, diversity, uh, whether it's of creed, color, race, gender, whatever it happens to be, we want to be inclusive. We want to make everybody feel as if they're valued. And that's right, because everybody is made by God, for God, in the image of God. But Satan, not made in the image of God, he has no good in him whatsoever. It's hard for us to come to terms with that concept. Think perhaps of the Terminator, maybe. But anyway, he is irredeemably evil. On earth is not his equal. Thomas Carlyle, in his translation, says, on earth is not his fellow. He has no friends here. We have no truck with him. There are no friends here of Satan. He goes on to say, did we in our own strength confide, our striving would be losing. If we rely on our own strength, then we'll fail. We cannot rely on our own strength. When it comes to fighting a spiritual battle against spiritual forces, you can't do it in your own strength. You just can't. You are too weak. We have no power of ourselves. In fact, one of the things about being human is that we rely completely on God, and that's the way he likes it. God wants us to be totally dependent on Jesus. All our strength, all our power, everything that we do is done through his strength. When people get healed, praise God for the healings this morning. It's fantastic to hear about those healings. I'm truly uh, grateful, you know, that I was a little part in that, praying for people, people getting healed. It's not my power. It's not my power. Nothing to do with me. I'm just the vessel. It's Jesus who heals. It's always through God. If we rely on our own strength, we will fail. We have to rely on the one who is a mighty fortress, our God, our Jesus. We're not the right man on our side, the man of God's own choosing. I wonder who that might be. Dost ask who that might be? Christ Jesus, it is he. Lord Sabaoth, his name, from age to age the same, and he must win the battle. Christ is our man. He is the one who has won the battle for us. Next verse. Luther goes on, almost obsessed with these devils. And though this world with devils filled should threaten to undo us, we will not fear, for God hath willed his triumph, uh, his truth to triumph through us. Talks about the world being full of devils. It's kind of um, a bit scary, isn't it? Well, if you look into the scripture, 
the scriptures would infer that um, some one-third of the angels followed Satan in his fall when he fell from heaven. He took nearly a third of the angels with him. So all of those are various grades of demon and spirit who are there to torment us and try and deflect us from our Christian walk and our Christian faith. We are beset with a spiritual battle that's going on all around us. But do not fear, we have the angels as well, who are spirits who are sent to minister to those who are receiving salvation. And all of this power comes through our communication with God at a spiritual level. Not on a human level, but at a spiritual level. So we need not fear, because his triumph has been preordained. The prince of darkness grim, we tremble not for him. His rage we can endure, for lo, his doom is sure. One little word shall fell him. The fact is that Satan is defeated. Maybe not yet, but he will be. But his doom is is sure. It has been preordained. It will happen. He will be cast into the lake of fire forever with uh, with all of the demons that follow him. That is not in doubt. Not in any doubt. Not even in Satan's mind is it in doubt. He knows that. And hence, as as we approach maybe the last days, he is more active. And he will be active in trying to defer those who are inheriting salvation. He's not interested so much in those who are not believers in Jesus Christ because they're, they're doomed. They have no power. They have no uh, authority over Satan. If, if you're not a believer, you have no authority over Satan. You cannot resist him unless you accept Christ as your savior. But for those of us who want to pursue a life of discipleship in Jesus Christ, then we need to follow him and to resist the devil. And we can. A word, a little word shall fell him. Maybe that word is a name. In the name of Jesus, we come against the power of darkness. And then he wraps it up. This world, that word, above all earthly powers, no thanks to them abideth. The spirit and the gift are ours through him, who, who with us sideth. So the Holy Spirit sides with us, Jesus sides with us, with us, and then he says, let goods and kindred go. This mortal life also, the body they may kill, God's truth abideth still, his kingdom is forever. We can lose everything that we have, like Job. Doesn't matter what you've got. All your worldly goods, all your family, all your kin, They can all go, even your life. You can lose everything, even your life. But God's truth abides still. His kingdom is forever, and we are part of that kingdom now. We don't have to wait until we die, until we are inheritors of the kingdom of God. We have that kingdom right now. We live in that kingdom. It is a reality in our lives that we are part of the kingdom of God. When we accept Christ as our Savior, we are part of that kingdom. So let me um, add some context to this hymn. What inspired Luther to write this hymn? Well, a little tiny bit of history, just a little bit. Martin Luther famously nailed 95 theses to the church door of the Schlosskirche at Wittenberg in 15, was it 1517? more than 500 years ago. Now, these theses were criticisms, basically. He took, um, he took a, a, a notice and nailed it to the uh, door of the Schlosskirche. And I like the fact that it was a Schlosskirche, not just any old church, it was a fortified church. And I wonder if that had a bearing on the fact that Luther wrote, Ein Fester Burg, you know, a mighty fortress is our God. So he actually nailed this to a fortified church in Wittenberg. And he wrote these 95 theses, which are essentially, these are all the points at which the church, the the established Roman Catholic, it would have been church, is wrong. These are the points at which your doctrine is incorrect. And these are criticism against how you are leading the people and the way that you are leading them astray. And primary amongst those uh, 
criticisms was his condemnation of the excesses and corruption of the Roman Catholic Church, in the, particularly against the papal practice of asking for payment called indulgences for the forgiveness of sins. Now, this is an appalling heresy for anybody who's read the scriptures would understand that we can actually buy forgiveness and buy our way into heaven is an utter heresy. But that was the prevailing paradigm of the day in the 16th century, that the church was teaching that you could come in, you could have a piece of paper, you could pay some money to the priest, walk away with your bit of paper, and you could have your sins wiped out. And that was just utterly wrong. Luther was able, as he was a scholar, uh, to read the scripture in Latin, in Greek, in Hebrew. So he understood from the scriptures that we are saved by grace through faith, not through any of our works, but through faith. And that to actually buy your salvation is appalling heresy. Absolutely appalling. And others too, around Luther, were architects of the Reformation, which led to the Protestant movement uh, overthrowing, well, not overthrowing, but, um, but growing up in, uh, in uh, opposition to the established Catholic Church. But you can imagine that somebody who is prepared to do something so significant and stand up uh, against the crowd would have faced enormous opposition. And of course he did. He appeared before church courts and was ultimately excommunicated, which means that the church said, right, you can't be a member of the church anymore. In other words, in that paradigm, in the eyes of the Catholic church, the established church, that meant he was going to hell. Luther knew, of course, no doubt from his own relationship with Christ, which must have been personal to him, and his understanding of the scriptures, that the established church was wrong and that he was right, that salvation was a free gift through grace, by faith, and not a matter of paying money to the church. But that pressure must have been enormous. And to have been excommunicated also must have been something which really played on his mind. As a religious, pious man, a monk, um, in the, in the church. And of course, he went and established himself up with others who were like-minded. But um, the thing is, what really inspired a lot of this hymn was the fact that he struggled himself. He struggled himself with gross feelings of inadequacy, that he wasn't good enough, that he was a sinner. And of course, these, these are the things that Satan attacks us with. How many times have you felt a voice in your head telling you that you're not good enough, that you shouldn't be doing the things that you're doing, that you shouldn't have done that thing again that you've done a hundred times, and that actually you're just useless, you know, you're not worth anything. Oh, you're not as good as that person over there. Look at what they're doing. They're doing this, you know, they're establishing churches, they're building schools, they're doing this, they're doing that. And you hear those voices in your head. Where does that come from? That's Satan. That's accusing you. Never mind what anybody else is doing. What has God asked you to do? Are you doing what God asked you to do? Don't look at anybody else. Are you living a life that is consistent with what the scripture asked? Okay, yes, you're going to fall. You're going to fall now and then. But you know what the Bible says about those who fall? He says, the steps of a good man or woman are ordered by the Lord and he delights in his way. No, you fall, you will not be cast down because the Lord will lift you up with his hand. That's what the Bible says. So Luther wrote this hymn as a testimony to his struggle against the voices of the enemy coming against him. And he overcame it ultimately through the word of God and through his understanding that it wasn't about his inadequacies or his sin, and we're all sinners. We're all sinners, and we continue to sin. We will continue to fall, but we're saved by grace, thank God. 
Luther must have been familiar with the verse in Colossians 2.15 that um, uh, it says, and having disarmed the powers and authorities, this is Jesus, having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle over them, triumphing over them by the cross. Now you'd think that the cross, an execution, uh, a means of executing a criminal would be a sign of weakness. And yet... Jesus was crucified on a cross which would seem to be an uh, ignominious defeat by anybody's standards was actually a fantastic victory over the powers of darkness. Because in dying over the cross, he took the sin of the whole world in himself so that we could all be free from sin, free from shame, free from guilt, and inherit eternal life. And the Bible tells us, actually, in a number of places that we're, we're in a struggle and that we're in a battle and that we are soldiers. In Ephesians 6, 12, it says, Our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. <clears throat> there are many military references in the Bible. We don't, like, we don't seem to... to, to to go with that these days, to to, to think that we are actually in a battle. I don't know if that's um, something that we've lost or what it is. I mean, we we look at the Salvation Army and you think, well, actually, they've got part of this right. They are structured like an army. Paul says to to Timothy in 1 Timothy 2, Uh, Sorry, 2 Timothy 2 verse 3. Endure hardship with us like a good soldier of Christ Jesus. We're actually a military force. We're an army. An army of soldiers following Christ Jesus. We are a military force. We have spiritual armor. Ephesians 6 uh, was mentioned this morning. We have spiritual defenses. And we have spiritual weapons. We have the sword of truth. The word of God is our weapon. And also prayer is a weapon. And then our defenses are truth, righteousness, the gospel, salvation, and faith. Perhaps we are afraid in our current society to give offense by actually saying that the church is an army. That we are a military force. Perhaps we have become so inclusive and so tolerant that we're afraid to give offence to people um, by saying that we are actually fighting a battle. When was the last time you sang Onward Christian Soldiers? I can't honestly remember. Perhaps there are people in this room this morning who don't even know that there's a hymn called Onward Christian soldiers. Well, if you've never heard it, (laughs) just quickly, I'll read the words. Onward Christian soldiers, marching us to war, with the cross of Jesus, going on before. Christ the royal master leads against the foe, forward into battle, see his banner go. At the sign of triumph, Satan's host has flee. On then, Christian soldiers, on to victory. Hell's foundations quiver at the shout of praise. Brothers, lift your voices, loud your anthems raise. Like a mighty army moves the church of God. Brothers, we are treading where the saints have trod. We are not divided, all one body we, one in hope and doctrine, one in charity. Onward then, ye people, join our happy throng. Blend with ours your voices in the triumph song. Glory, Lord, and honour unto Christ the King. This through countless ages men and angels sing. Onward, Christian soldiers marching us to war with the cross of Jesus going on before. Stirs you up, doesn't it? It encourages you, raises the blood, gives you strength and a, uh, a sense of triumph over the enemy. And what's wrong with that, I have to ask? What's wrong with beating the drum now and then and doing a bit of sabre rattling and declaring our 
victory. There's nothing wrong with that. We seem to be ashamed to do it. You know, I'd rather sing some of these hymns than perhaps a hymn about a, light, a song about a lighthouse. Oh, sorry, I won't say that. I won't mention that again. It is my least favourite chorus, but anyway. Um, <clears throat> what's wrong with shouting the victory now and then? You know, we sang Be Bold, Be Strong. That was um, at my request, I think. Uh, didn't we enjoy that this morning? Wasn't it great singing Be Bold, Be Strong again? When was the last time you sang that? And then in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, we have the victory. In the name of Jesus, demons will have to flee. We don't sing these songs. Let's not be afraid of declaring the victory. And in our victory isn't just, I've, I've spoken rather uh, extensively, or Martin Luther speaks rather extensively over our victory over the powers of darkness and over the powers of evil. It's not just the powers of darkness and evil. As the readings that we read this morning show, it's victory over sin and guilt and shame. Romans 8 was read. We are more than conquerors through Christ who gives us strength. And then 1 Corinthians 15 was read. We have victory over death. Through Christ, we have victory over death itself. Uh, in fact, it says in, in 1 Corinthians 15, Where, O death, is your, um, where, o death, is your, uh, is your sting? Where, O death, is your victory? Death has been swallowed up in victory. The sting of death is sin, the power of sin is law. But thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. He gives us the victory. That's worth singing about, isn't it? It's worth celebrating, isn't it? And maybe it's worth um, shouting about as well. So next time you're on holiday and you visit a castle or a fortified city, Carcassonne or somewhere like that, Remember that our God is ein Festerborg, a mighty fortress. And um, remember then that Luther's had his struggle. He had this struggle with the enemy over inadequacy, feelings of inadequacy. But he overcame that because he knew that his God was a mighty fortress and would not fail him. And despite the fact he took on the might of the established Catholic Church, in the end, he won. Let me just end with a few words from another old song. It goes like this. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing it will be. When we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Peter. Oh, I missed that, didn't I? <laughs>